Welcome to Grief Chat with myself, Mark Lemon. For today's episode, I'm delighted to be speaking with Ashling Mustan and Zoe Bassett. Bassett, Hi, I said it. There we go. But I'm just yeah. going to run with this. because <laughs> For the viewers, we've just been through the names however many times, but welcome, guys. Hi, Mark. Um, so for the viewers, would you be able to just uh, give us a bit of background about yourselves and your own experience with grief, please? And I will come to you first, Zoe. Absolutely, yeah. So, hi guys. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. It's always such a pleasure to be uh, to be talking dead parents, as morbid as that sounds. Um, my dad died in a mid-air collision just before I was turned three, about six days before I turned three. Um, he loved to fly. He was a broker in London, but loved to fly. So yeah, two, two planes crashed. And that left behind myself, my brother, age 18 months, and my mum, who was amazing. Um, and... At the time, it didn't really affect me. I don't think it really noticed it. But when I was about eight, I really noticed it. And uh, mum said really sort of quite astutely, do you feel like you've got an apple stuck in your throat? And I was like, that's exactly how I feel. So that was the point where I got in contact with Winston's Wish, who are also involved in the festival at some point along the line. And they're an amazing child bereavement charity, but we'll come back to that, I'm sure. Thank you. And how about you, Ashling? Um, so I uh, was born in Australia. Um, it's quite confusing because I have an Irish accent. Um, I was born in Australia. Uh, my dad was Australian and my mum uh, is Irish. Um, my dad died in a car accident when I was three and a half. Um, and I, like Zoe, had a baby brother. Has a, I have a baby brother. He is still my baby brother. Uh, a baby brother and um, my mum left behind. Um, and then we also left Australia a, a year after he died, which was kind of the secondary loss um, of the situation. Yeah, so uh, very similar to Zoe, really sudden, really, yeah, ripped the rug out from underneath everybody in our family and, and beyond and sent ripples, uh, very far reaching ripples through the lives of many people. I mean, it's quite incredible how this conversation, you both have very similar stories and i know my dad was 12 years old when he was killed but so all of us kind of have that um similarity in terms of not growing up with our dads you know they, they weren't around they weren't part of our lives and i'm just wondering for both of you how that how you dealt with that throughout your teenage years your younger years and how it affected you um and that's to you ashley yeah i mean it was it feels like it was a hugely defining factor in my life you know for my whole life um i think i was reflecting on this a couple of days ago i think when you lose a parent when you're so young they're your hero you know you haven't had the teenage years with them you haven't had the you know the struggles of sort of trying to um become an adult and uh, you know stake your claim on things they're perfect you know your parent is perfect when you're three and a half so it's a very hard loss to get your head around because this perfect person has, has gone and left this enormous hole in your life um and i think another part of it is that you grow with your grief so you experience it really differently at different stages um you know and also when you're, uh, I think Zoe and I were talking before, when you're three, you have no memory of not being bereaved. So it's just, gr gr your grief is your life, you know, it's just life. You don't remember what it was like to not have lost somebody incredibly significant. So I don't know what it would have been like had I not been bereaved. I don't know who I would be. Um, and I also feel that that bereavement has grown with me and that I've grown grown up with my grief and that I process it differently. Um, certainly at different, for me, the, when I turned to the age that he was when he died, I experienced really significant grief for the first time. I, I went to a very, it felt like it had happened yesterday. Um, and that kind of recognition that now the photos of him were going to be older than me, uh, were going to be younger than me, was extremely difficult for me um, because he was my father. And how was he going to get younger than me? So that was a really interesting period of kind of eight years where I experienced really intense grief around it. And I would say that I'm now 41. I'm on the other side of that bit now where I feel a huge amount of acceptance. Now it's still there and it can still blindside me, 
but I feel a lot of acceptance around it. And um, I went back to Australia for the first time where he died in 20 years this year. And that was a real kind of, that felt like the end of that journey of, you know, from 32 to now of, of really grieving for him as an adult, you know, because the thing is you have different levels of awareness at every age, you know, when you're 15, you understand certain things about life. When you're 21, when you're 30, you know, there's all these different things. And I'm sure Zoe, you really, uh, and both of you really relate to the idea that it's the little things like going to university and it's like, oh, he's not there to, to sort of be proud of me. Or when you have your first heartbreak or you meet your partner or, you know, you, for Mark, you, when you have, when you've got children. Um, yeah, I think that, that is also, sorry, I'm waffling on a bit. Um, I think that's also, you know, something that you guys probably really identify with. Absolutely. Yeah. Zoe, how about you? Yeah, I, I completely relate to pretty much everything that was said there, apart from, I guess, getting to the age when my dad was, my dad was 34, not the similar age, I think, um, to you yeah. actually, when he died. Um, and I haven't got to that age yet, so I can't I can't tell you how that's going to be or what, what that's going to look like. Um, but I definitely agree with you in terms of the growing with grief. So many people always say, oh, you talk about it so well, you you must be so healed from it. Like you're, it's like not a thing anymore. And it's like, it totally is a thing anymore, but it's just, it's just a thing that I can absolutely kind of incorporate into my daily life. And you're right, like it catches you off guard. Like nobody's like a mosquito in the shower. It's the only way I can describe it. It's like, <laughs> whoa, okay, didn't expect that. Um, but actually there's been no situation where I haven't been able to kind of regroup and actually remember that that person must have been really special for you to be still having that moment. Um, so I think there's so much to be said for kind of having had a bereavement when you're little. And, and for me, I felt a lot of guilt around that because people are like, oh, well, if you don't remember him, then like, are you really grieving him? Do, it, it can't be as bad, which I've always loathed because actually you're missing the person, as you say, that wasn't there, that isn't there. And you're missing, you're not missing the character. Like, I've heard he's a great guy. I've heard he's amazing and cool. And I will never know, but I miss not having that person. Um, and I'm so blessed to have like the most amazing family and step family and extended family. And it, I'm so lucky, but you guess, I, I guess you just don't know. I always kind of have that like what if like god imagine how different my life would be imagine imagine his second opinion and what he would say and um in lots of different circumstances and i think as well i mentioned this before it's just about creating like a new normal so often people are like oh it's quite like not abnormal the situation you've got but um it's not the norm whatever the norm is um and so it's just like my mom always says to me it's like it's our normal um our normal is having lots of random people who we class as family who are definitely not blood related or um me and my mum my brother just like the three musketeers we're we're each other's normal and that always gave me so much solace um surprisingly and just in just knowing that and having that to sort of jump back to yeah i really yeah. relate to that zoe I, I i like you again more more similarities i have um a, you know a big family now my mum remarried and i have um a brother another brother and sister and there are two things that i loathe in life it's number one when people say to me oh but you mustn't remember him so that's okay and it's like oh my god what are you talking about <laughs> and the, and when people call my brother and sister my half brother and sister you know yeah. th there's the two things that i'm just like when you feel like somebody's minimizing um you know the love and the strength of those connections that you have with those people um because actually memory is is just a tiny part of grief you know it's uh, and wouldn't we love to have more memories i think that's the thing it's it's the it's the idea of like you're touching a nerve because i would love to have clear you know more clear and kind of um less three-year-old <laughs> memories of things yeah do you remember I that? well i don't know i don't know if i remember him I don't know if it's a memory yeah. yeah and that's and that's like that's not something that you can easily be like no that's fine because i i don't know and that like people just don't realize when they ask them, well do you even remember him it's like it's actually quite sensitive like I, I don't know I don't know if I remember him and that kind of hurts because I have no memories of my dad if I don't remember him yeah so please yeah. can everyone just like <laughs> stop asking me yeah. <laughs> yeah. In a weird sense. but I think that the thing that I've come to the conclusion of over time with that is that I don't need memories of him because 
it, it's the the idea of love and the feeling of love that I have from him is so complete and yeah. so um, intense and beautiful that actually that completely overrides any memories that I have of anybody. You know, love isn't a memory. Love is a, it's a, it's, it's a feeling, you know, it's a, it's a part of you. Um, so I think that over time, that's something that I have, yeah, that has replaced memory for me, I think. I think there's also that element of, oh, well, he, he died when you were really young, you know, you should be over it now. Surely you should be talking about it. You know, you shouldn't be writing about it and all this stuff. And it's like, no, like he's constantly present. Like you said, the grief evolves, it changes. No day is the same. You might get the mosquito in the shower. Um, and um, and that's that's why we keep talking about it. And like you said, love is a huge element of that. Um, and something that I'm quite passionate about is just using that love to sort of drive me forward in life as, uh, you know, and that's why I called my podcast Superpower because it is a superpower. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if you guys have both felt that too in terms of everything that you do um throughout your life um that you have done that you've achieved have you found it like your own inner strength um i, that's I, too love, I love this phrase of the superpower because i couldn't agree more i think um so often people see it as so de detrimental in life but it's given me the like amazing ability to share my story with so so many people who actually this has happened to too and I hope that they seek solace in that but I will never be able to tell obviously um but I can also talk to anyone about everything I'm such an open person and I'm so lucky to have that ability and I totally bring that down to having lost a parent when I was little but also I have very much got an attitude of like you just got to live day to the fullest like if you for example really trivial but this is something we always do in our family if someone gives you a bottle of champagne and wine don't keep it if all your family are together, we drink it. I know it sounds ridiculous, but there, there could be a moment where I could step out onto the road and get hit by a bus and we never will have drank that champagne. And that is not worth not knowing about. So as a result, my friends have very much adopted that mentality where if one of us gets a bottle of champagne or a bottle of nice wine and we're all together, that is enough of a celebration and a reason to open it. So I think so often we're just like so worried about this like, mentality of like saving things to the future and doing this but I think you just get an idea of presence so much it's more, so much more astutely um having lost someone so young and having that awareness for like actually you know if, if I die tomorrow I've had the most amazing day today and I'm so lucky for that um so I'd definitely call that a superpower if if I was being yeah if I was being honest yeah I love that I love that just drink the wine drink the champagne drink guys <laughs> Wine. <laughs> I think my last podcast I talked about how we used to celebrate my dad's um, death and birthday with uh, a martini because he loves martinis. So I think every single podcast or everything I've ever done, it always just comes back to booze and so yeah. <laughs> It's not like that, I promise. <laughs> how about I you, Ashley? Too. Yeah, I love that. And I similarly have had this, you know, always had a really open, honest, almost, you know, to the point where I completely overshare all the time. But I also, yeah, people just seem to share their life stories with me everywhere I go. And I love that, you know, I wouldn't want to be any other way. And yeah, it has been a superpower for sure. Now, saying it's been a superpower, it's also been my, my, you know, my, what do they call it? Uh, yeah, my black beast as well. And it has caused me a huge amount of problems in terms of my relationships with men and, you know, uh, how I, yeah, how I see myself in that respect. But yes, in terms of my purpose and my ability to connect with other people, I, yeah, I mean, it has, it has been a superpower. I'm incredibly driven uh, to make the world a better place and um, to help people to connect with each other through their emotional experiences, which is why I curate Good grief festival. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it has for sure been a superpower. Um, I think it's been, it, 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 and I have different superpowers at different ages as well. You know, I think when I was in my twenties, I was really, really good at being positive and just saying, everything's fine. <laughs> Whereas in my forties, I'm more kind of like getting into the idea of it's okay, everything's not fine. <laughs> and I'm gonna fall apart today and that's all right. Um, so yeah, I think it is definitely a superpower, um, but there are caveats to that. 
No, I completely agree with both of you. And um, I guess moving on to COVID-19, you know, what a big year it's been for everybody. And it still continues to be a massive year in terms of people struggling with their grief and the world changing. And I'm just wondering how you guys have sort of navigated uh, your own grief throughout this year and if it's been affected at all, um, resurfaced anything. Um, that's to you, Ashley. So this year has been huge for me in terms of my grief because I went back to Australia for the first time in 20 years. Um, and my dad's buried in Australia, so I've only been to his grave twice in my adult life. Um, and I had lost touch with um, many family and friends there as well. So that was quite a big trip. And that happened just before lockdown. So I did it in February, which was just like, honestly, like sort of miraculous. And I thought the trip was going to be every time I've been to Adelaide, it's been enormously hard for me because I'm back in the place that we were together. We were never we, we never lived in Ireland together. So I've got no memories. I've got no uh, muscle memory of being there with him. But when I go to Adelaide, it's there and all of his family and his friends are there and all of our connection to each other. So it's really intense. Um, but I went back and it was amazing. You know, it was just absolutely amazing. And I feel like I, I suppose my grief is slightly complicated in that I lost my dad, but I lost my life. You know, I lost the life that I had lived with my dad up until that point. You know, we left Australia a year later. My granny and granddad were there, my aunts, you know, all of our friends. And I didn't see them for, you know, a really, really, really long time afterwards. So, um, and back then flying was too expensive. <laughs> Even calling somebody in Australia was a twice a year thing. You know, it was, it was really, it was really limiting. So I've always had that feeling that there's this life that I didn't live, that it's split off from me, that I have two lives, one that I, I left in Australia with my dad and one that I lived in Ireland. And so I've always felt quite fragmented as a person. And the trip back to Australia, I, I felt like I picked up those fragments and I reincorporated them into myself. And I reconnected with my family there and how, and my and their our family friends and have, you know, they were all incredible, absolutely incredible. So I don't have that feeling of loss that I didn't live that life anymore because I know I have that life again. And uh, it, it's there and it's, you know, I can, I can go back anytime I want. And, you know, all of those relationships have stayed the same because they're so strong. Um, so I got back having had this kind of quite euphoric, quite life changing uh, trip to Australia and then went into lockdown and I was not prepared for that at all. And so I had a very hairy six weeks of being on a very, very intense grief roller coaster. Um, and then I came, you know, as you do with grief, I, I, I the waves came and I rode the waves and then the waves settled down. and. Since then, it's been, yeah, a lot of big change, which often happens after you've come through a big, uh, you know, a growth spurt, a grieving growth spurt. That's what it is, isn't it? When you lose a parent when you're young, you have your grieving growth spurts the same way you have growing pains. Um, yeah. So, yeah, my COVID-19 experience has been really, was really intense, but also really amazing and life changing. Um, yeah. How about you, Zoe? <laughs> so I guess um, 2020 was always going to be a big year for me because it's exactly 20 years since we lost our dad. So it is one of those years that's just like, right, so we've lost him for 20 years. And that is not a sadness thing. That is genuinely a celebration thing now. We're so lucky that we're able to do that as a family. And my mum's boyfriend present um, at current is... Um, used to be best friends with my dad so he was there to celebrate too and it was a very weird circumstance because it was mid-April so we we're in lockdown as you say and it felt very intense it felt like I couldn't get any breathing space because I've always like seen my family on that day but never just like been there all day with them um so I guess there was that intensity but I guess in terms of 2020 overall so I was very aware that I wanted to do something that was fundraising a variety um my, my brother's a musician and we were desperate to do a gig obviously that's not gonna happen anymore um but I think it also highlights how many people are losing parents and grandparents and I think so often um I forget that the impact of losing a grandparent is just as as key or friend or family member is just as key as losing a parent um when you're little and so 
I've had this awareness of like, there's so many kids out there that are being affected like me. So it's just any opportunity to like reach out and, and not share my story, but also allow them to share theirs and, and know that that, that is kind of normal um, and that you're not alone in that because that, as we mentioned before, so much solace in, in knowing that you're not the only person who's lost a parent um, or grandparent and et cetera, et cetera. So I think 2020 has brought up so much bereavement, but it's also brought up so much conversation. Um, and I think there's so much more to be had. And I'm excited about this kind of new wave of like, bereavement is, is, is a thing and let's talk about it um, rather than like not and hiding away from it and kind of share our feelings. So yeah, I think it's a, it's been a really awful year, but hopefully good things will come from it. Mm. How, how about you, Mark? How is, how's your experience of COVID been? Yeah, so initially I was, I, a bit like you, I felt the wave. And after Christmas, I, can't, I hadn't done any more podcast interviews. And I, I sort of had a bit of a quiet time in terms of talking to people about grief. And um, yeah, it kind of, at first, it really did affect my mental health, actually. And, and the sort of the resurfacing of grief, because I, now, because I've got two young children, I was thinking, oh, what if I get this, you know, mm. what happened to me? And all these sort of really um, <laughs> unrational thoughts were going through my head in terms of things like that. But, um, you know, so that kind of really affected me. And I had to sit down with my wife, who's great with talking to me about this subject. Actually, she has to be, really. Um, and, um, and, and just sort of trying to kind of reevaluate. Like you said, going through your own sort of uh, wave of... Um, you know, you, you have your sort of peaks in your life. And I think this has been a big one for me, actually, sort of really um, rethinking about my approach to grief, um, my everyday thoughts around this subject, um, just realizing that, like you said, Zoe, you know, no day's the same. You've got to, you've got to kind of enjoy every morning. Um, and I think that's, if anything, it spurred me on even more to want to keep talking about my grief and so I started the podcast again and just interviewing people. I thought this is a perfect opportunity, like to just to get people to open up wherever they are in their kitchen and, you know, and, um, and talk about this subject again. And, you know, it's one like the festival is showing that people want to hear because unfortunately there are lots of people out there struggling. And, and so for me initially, yeah, I was affected. Um, but it was like a bit like you six weeks in and then I kind of slowly and my dad's anniversary was on the 12th of May. And for the first time this year, I really tried to involve the children. It was really nice. We sort of went out, we a bit like Winston's Wish does with the children there. And they we wrote a little message on the on a note, tied it to a balloon. And we, we sort of set them off in this field, actually in the field where I um, came up with the idea for the Magical Wood, the children's book that I wrote. Um, and so we watched these balloons go off and it was a really special moment because, um, yeah, it kind of involved the children and, uh, and it kind of felt like a shift as well with the family and talking about my dad. Mm -hmm. And so in a way it's pushed me into a positive um, stage of my grief, I felt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel the same, yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. And I think, well, for me, well, maybe I'd love to hear your experiences, both of you as well, of how losing somebody in that kind of just avoidable, sudden, totally unpredictable way affected you personally in terms of living with fear and living with, um, you know, kind of what I would describe as for me a terror of, of that knowledge of oh my God, anything could happen at any moment to me or anybody I love. I'd love to hear, yeah, from you about how, what your experience of that was. Mm. Absolutely. I think um, from my side of things, I was, in, my mom has a pilot's license as well. Um, I was intrinsically terrified of flying. And do you know what I hadn't actually, ironically, hadn't matched up to my dad. Um, having died in a plane crash at all. I literally was just, I don't know if you know, you know, from the terminal to the plane, that tunnel, mm. fear, the fear is like nothing else. And I was just, and actually to be fair, right, like now I'm absolutely fine. Um, but it is funny how you get these like really irrational like thoughts about certain things like planes, but actually the planes are fine. I mean, you think it makes sense, but 
that the chance of that happening is so slim so so slim um but you do also think i don't know if you've ever felt this guys but i i kind of feel i think a lot more about what would happen or what i what i'd do if i'd lost if i lost my mum or if i lost my brother and which i don't think i don't know but i don't think many people think about that like i don't think that's a, a that's a, a quite regular thought i i quite often think oh god like what would I do if I, which is so rational. And it obviously probably only lasts like five minutes, but it's a thought that crossed my mind. And it's this weird, like, disaster, we're a disaster planning family. We, yeah. we kind of go, yeah. what, who, who are your, like ever since we were little, um, it was always like, what's your disaster plan? Who are you, yeah. you going to be hanging out with? And mom's always, always incorporated this into her will. She's always been like, right, disaster plan. Who do you want to live with? Because <laughs> you're going to live with your uncle, but also our best family friends live down the road and, I'd be much happier there because they've also lost um, their dad when they were little. So we were, do you know what I mean? And so we, as a result, are like, we, I wouldn't say we're organised in the slightest. I mean, we're a mess. But actually, in terms of like, yeah, thoughts that no one else seems to have. <laughs> I plan for these things. <laughs> I've got all in the head, and it's yeah. I think it's it's definitely that's definitely a factor. Yeah, I always know when I like somebody or they mean something to me because the first thing I do is I imagine what how I would feel if they die <laughs> like literally the first <laughs> time I like have a connection with somebody I imagine oh they're really great I wonder how I'd feel if they die <laughs> honestly and actually I've never had this conversation with anyone before because I think it's 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 quite weird and people kind of think oh god you must be so depressed or so sad that's not I don't feel depressed I I just it's a rational thought that goes through my mind or irrational as it seems we're going exactly God, I don't know what I'd do if my best mate died. But no one else surely thinks about that. I don't know, maybe they do. Maybe they do, and I'm not. How about you, Mark? I'm, yeah, I'm completely with you. Obviously, you know, with my dad, because he was murdered, it's like, shit, this, anything could happen now. You know, from going forward, from this point onwards, anything could happen, you know. And so, like you guys, I'll think up the scenario in my head, you know, even to this day. And I have to quickly go, like, snap out of this with my kids, with my... Um, and I, you know, I have to quickly say this is this is just uh, irrational. It's part of your history. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, you know. And like in my head, sometimes, <laughs> like with your disaster plan, I'm already thinking it out. You know, what will I do? How will I feel if my wife died? Yeah. Um, how will I deal with this scenario? Um, what will we do? And so I'm this, you know, without this even happening, I'm working it out in my head as to what I'm going to do, how I'm going to cope. And I think this also comes down to, I think when you've gone through traumatic loss, I'm not sure about you guys, but you already have that kind of controlling mechanism inside of you to try and to try to control things in your life because mm -hmm. I didn't have any control over that. It was, you know, something that I love more than anything on earth was just taken away from me. Mm -hmm. And so now how can I control it and, and make that not happen, you know? Mm -hmm. And you can't. You know, it's, it's something out of your hands. So. And it can hold you back so much as well, because I feel like that fear of loss actually is sometimes even worse than the loss itself. You know, that kind of, I think I, for me, I was afraid of loss and I was terrified of grief as well, because I'd grown up with adults who were very deeply bereaved and weren't really able to process it properly. So that felt very dark for me growing up. Um, now I had a wonderful, amazing mom who, you know, like I'm sure both of your mothers has, was, you know, a hero, like an absolute hero. Um, but everybody, it was a different time and people weren't really able to confront their grief. So I developed this fear of grief, which is a fear of loss, which is a fear of actually having things because when you have things and you like them and you're connected to them, then you might lose them. So you sort of make, I was making decisions in my life that were based on fear so much. And I think that now I'm not, you know, now I kind of fill into my fear a little bit more. Um, but I just think it's really interesting when you've had, you know, experiences that we've had, that you you understand loss in this way that it's so omnipresent, that, you, that it's really hard to kind of go, yeah, this happens, but it's okay. And I think that actually what comes in the end is your knowledge that whatever happens, I'm really strong. And I will, I know that I have the tools and I know that I'm, I, I have the relationships and the anchors to get me through whatever happens. And I don't have to be afraid of loss anymore. I was about to say, it's kind of a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because you, one side of you has that fear, but on the other side, I have the fear of 
not really of just going for something you know mm -hmm. and just running with it and you know my wife and other people always say god when do you put your mind to something you achieve <laughs> it you know this is amazing and i'm just like yes because i have this inner drive to yeah. to that i've always had since i was you know a young boy mm -hmm. that just what's you know just go for it and um yes it's kind of an odd one you're sort of battling one thing and then the other side of it is like yeah. okay isn't that um, because yeah. that's the two poles of that side of things yeah 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 absolutely um so i just want to talk a little bit about winston's wish um and how you um started working with them what made you want to work with them um yeah i know you know briefly whether you you want to sort of talk about those guys because i'm an ambassador for them as well it's an incredible charity and uh yeah oh yeah i mean these guys i could um I could talk all day about them. They really, they, they changed my life and there's no, there's no other less cringy way of putting it. Um, so yeah, as I said, when I was eight, um, I think that was when it really hit me and I started writing letters to heaven um, and doing things that I just desperately wanted to like understand what I was feeling and, and feel a sense of normality in like, you know, at school, my mum wouldn't pick me up because we had a nanny because she had to work full time, which is absolutely fine. And it was just, I guess getting in a bit of more of an understanding of why it was that it was us and not someone else or why how we kind of how we kind of deal with it in a day-to-day -day. it's just very normal for us but then it was kind of having that like more self-awareness of realizing that it's actually not that normal whatever normal is um so i was very lucky because i wasn't in um winston's wishes catchment area which is cheltenham at the time or was Cheltenham at the time we lived in essex um but they decided to reach out and help us and my brother and i went to a camp which was a two-day like it was literally like camp as you can imagine all star american like marshmallows on the fire singing songs but it was also like creating sand jars of um his favorite things to do in different colors or like a, a reel of what you think happened and like processing that and throwing mud at a wall and stuff like that and for me the biggest thing was just being with other kids, every single person there, including all the practitioners had lost someone. And that was the first time I was around that because for the first time I wasn't, I wasn't the odd one out, I was normal, which was huge. Um, so then I went on to ask them if I could help and, and there wasn't really any, any opportunity to do that because you had to be a practitioner, which obviously I wasn't at the age of 12. <laughs> so I um, then, they then introduced the Young Ambassadors um, when I was 18. So I joined that. And again, awesome, because on a very personal level, people go, how'd your mum die? And they go, cancer. And I go, how'd, they go, how'd your dad die? And I go, plane crash. And they go, what'd you have for breakfast? And it was just so, so reassuring to know that people were like, cool, yeah, me too, and could kind of move on with the conversation. I don't expect that from the general public. I don't. But would be nice if we could get there one day um so ever since i have done whatever i can with them so um being one of the only london-based um young ambassadors i've had some awesome opportunities i've interviewed practitioners for grenfell i've been on a board like a oh, what's it called uh board no was it panel um for rathbones which was like adults bereaved as children i've been so fortunate to be involved in everything and so often they're like well thank you so much for giving your time but for me it's just like it's just not even a question. I just love talking about it so much. And I love sharing what they did for me and my family. So I will be forever grateful. And yeah, any kids um, or young adults who are breathing, please, please send them that way. Because yeah, they'll change their lives. It's an incredible charity. And um, yeah, really, really thankful to be involved with them. Um, I just want to end on a question for you both in terms of if you've got any tips for somebody out there that's grieving at the moment um little nuggets of gold that might help you both you know in times when you need it most and like we've talked about already it can go in waves and then it comes goes again um Ashling, how about you are there anything you know particular that really helps you i think for me the, the that concept of growing with your grief is a really really important one and don't let anybody try to hurry you through your grief when you've lost a parent when you're young um it's so unique to everybody anyway. Grief is, is, is you know, as unique as you are. Um, but I do think that when you sort of know that you're growing with your grief, you know what to expect the same way you know that you're gonna, your hair is gonna change over time, you know, and you're gonna, your body shape is gonna change over time. Your grief is also gonna change over time. 
we were in another i was in another conversation yesterday about childhood bereavement and i this theory came up that i had never heard of but that as somebody you you guys will both be like oh um and you may have heard of it um it's the um ball in a box ball in a box theory or but something about a ball in a box and the idea is that your grief when you it first happens is this huge ball basically and it takes up all the space in the box but as you get older and as you move on from your grief it, the box gets bigger and bigger around it so your life gets bigger and bigger and bigger around your grief and you there are new relationships and new people and new experiences and your grief is still always there but what's around it gets bigger and bigger and bigger so i think it's kind of a way of you know people say time is a healer i find that quite trite sometimes but i think that this is a it, it is the same sort of thing that you know you grow your life grows around your grief and it's still you know it's still that really really fundamental part of you and it is a part of your heart that isn't you know that is no longer there but there's all these other amazing things that happen in your life and other relationships and other connections that you know are also part of part of your journey and I, so i think that's yeah that would be my piece of advice how about um, you zoe where where do you start with advice i mean it's like <laughs> It's like you, so many different things have worked for so many different like times in in life, as you say. Um, but I think for me, it would be um, sharing how you feel. I know it sounds, you know, people always talk about the bottling up situation, and as much as I hate repeating everyone else, it is true. Um, just having that conversation with people, and you you won't believe what you'll learn about the person that you've lost, but also about yourself and the person that you're talking to as well. So for example, this is 20 years on, I was talking to my mom the other day about a story I was actually talking to Ashley about. And it was so interesting because she was like, I actually, I think you've remembered that quite differently to how, how it was. And so we started talking about the story as it was and, and gave me more details. And she was like, did you know this? And did you know that? And it's like, God, I, I feel like I'm 20 years down the line and, and still, still learning and still understanding so much more and, and that gave me so much peace so I think the more you can kind of chat to people even if they haven't lost someone kind of they they will listen and they might not understand but they'll listen to you nonetheless so I think it's definitely worth giving it a go and just sharing sharing what you're feeling at the moment yeah. uh, I'm, I'm with you both I think through talking sharing being creative you know things like that, writing, drawing, however you're getting your emotions, your expression of your grief out is just going to help you. And um, Ashling, Zoe, I just want to say a big thank you for today. You've both been brilliant. And uh, yeah, thank you so much.